Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. For Gen Bio this week, we're going to go over ecology and different components of ecology. And so I want to start with introducing you to general ecology or the basics of ecology. And so ecology is a very diverse field. Um, it can include just examining a single species, so kind of uh, species ecology. It can examine how species interact with other species. Um, so you can get kind of a simple community college ecology. Um, it can look at biomes or regions in the world where you get biome ecology. And so <clears throat> ecology is very broad. And so we're going to kind of give an overview of ecology in this lecture and then I'll go into some of the more uh, I guess you could say more specifics of ecology. So here's an example of kind of a food web and so you might be examining like a prairie habitat or a forested habitat or something like that and you might be examining what players you have. The green dots would represent primary uh, producers so these are photosynthetic organisms you know like this plant here, this clover here and then you would have primary consumers, uh, the organisms that are eating the plants, and then uh, secondary consumers, okay, or in this case, the top of the food chain, top of the pyramid, um, and that would just be, you know, the end of the pyramid. These consumers would be consuming the primary consumers. Okay, all right. So we'll come back. We'll look at some other issues, but this is one way to analyze um, the ecological components of a given region. So maybe you have jackrabbits here, and so maybe we're interested in if the population of jackrabbits increase, what's going to occur to their primary food source, which might be this clover here, and then what about their primary uh, predator that's going to consume that jackrabbit, what's what's going on there? Okay? And so that's that's of interest to ecologists who study communities and the effect of different things on the community. So population influxes, or maybe we say, well, jackrabbits have been removed from the population. Are we gonna have an explosion of clover? Or is there other primary consumers that could take over and consume that? Okay? And we'll look at these different things as we progress through ecology. Okay, so first I wanted to just go through kind of basics of what is ecology. So in general, ecology is just how organisms interact with each other within a certain environment. Okay? Again, like I said before, this could be a localized environment. Maybe you're just looking at the ecology of a single pond, or maybe you're looking at the ecology of the deserts in the world. Okay? And so really it just depends on the individual and how they go about uh, examining the ecology and what scale they want to examine the ecology um, at. Okay? So the other piece of ecology is we're often interested in just a single part of ecology. So maybe we're interested in where organisms are at on a landscape or how are they distributed on the landscape or what's going on with their population is it growing is it shrinking these are all ecological questions and still get at how organisms interact with each other in a given environment so let's look at some ways at which ecology can be organized or um, ecological fields okay? First of all, you can be examining ecology or the ecology of a group of organisms or population that occupy the same place, same time, and have the potential to reproduce. So that's all a population is, a group of organisms that occupy the same region, same time, and have the potential to reproduce. So there are lots of population ecologists out there, and they might be examining endangered species, they might be examining common species and they're examining that the interaction between that species that population and their given environment in some cases 
population ecologist might be examining the entire species. Right? And let's, let's take humans, for example. Let's say you're a population ecologist of humans. You're most likely not examining all 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet and their interactions with their environment. So instead what you're examining is localized population. Maybe you're examining urban individuals. Maybe you're examining rural individuals. Maybe you're examining individuals within a certain town or a certain country. So from a human perspective, population ecologists rarely are going to examine all humans on the planet. But let's flip that coin a little bit and start talking about other species. So how about devil's hole pupfish? Uh, this is probably the most endangered species of fish on the planet. Uh, I mean, at best, there's 50 of them um, in a little pool of water uh, between Nevada and California in a place called Devil's Hole. It's the only place they occur in the world. And so for a population ecologist in that standpoint, you study the entire species. You study every single population because there's only one. And you know and can know everything there is to know about those 50 fish that are in existence in that single population. Okay, so it really just depends on, you know, what species people are examining. And that goes back to that species, biological species concept, phylogenetic species concept. What are people examining? Um, and that kind of gives them that avenue of, well, are you examining all the populations? Or are you examining just a couple populations of, you know, a sample size of the entire population? So species, again, there are species ecologists where they study um, one species and they study the interactions of that species with their environment. Right? So like Devil's Hole, that's pretty easy. They occur in one region, that's it. Um, humans, it's very difficult. Right? We occur across the entire planet and no researcher has the capability of studying all the humans on the planet. So there's no species ecologist for humans. But for things that are threatened, endangered, or local, are localized in a given region, you can have a species ecologist. Community ecologists, these are individuals that examine all the species and, and all the populations of species within a given region. So maybe you're a community ecologist and you're studying the redwoods uh, in California. Or maybe you're studying um, the red desert in Wyoming. Or maybe you're studying uh, canyonlands in Utah. These different regions, right, you can study all the organisms in that given region, all the species in that given region because it's localized and, and so that's what a community ecologist would do. Ecosystem ecologist is a little harder um, because there's typically ecosystems are much larger and much more expansive um, but there are ecosystem ecologists that might study smaller ecosystems like North American deserts uh, and maybe they're exa examining the communities of organisms that live in the North American deserts or uh, you know, North America, tropical forest, tropical rainforest. Um, and so these regions, ecologists can get into and, and study them. Okay. All right. Biomes, again, m even more difficult. Um, and whether we're talking about aquatic habitat or terrestrial habitat, biome is dictated by typically the temperature and the rainfall in a given region. Okay? And also taking into account the plants that grow in that region. Because remember that plants, the plants growing in a given region is also going to dictate what animals can survive in that given region. Because plants are autotrophs. They make their own energy. Animals are heterotrophs. Okay? They consume their energy. So animals are dictated by whatever is consumable in a given environment. Plants, on that other hand, they're normally dictated whether 
or not, the temperature is correct, the moisture is correct, and then the nutrient levels in a given region are correct for them to grow. So a biome is normally categorized by temperature, precipitation, and the plants that grow there. Okay. And so biomes themselves can be really expansive, and you're not going to be finding biome ecologists. But again, at a localized level, a biome can be examined. And you might examine the abiotic and the biotic characteristics. So abiotic meaning non-living characteristics. And this could be temperature, precipitation, soil nutrients, the pH, uh, the wind speed, all these things, non-living. And then the biotic, all the living assemblages. And that would be the plants, the animals, okay, the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoans, these kind of things that would live in that given region. And the last one, which no one is a biosphere ecologist. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't examine the ecology of the world but they examine it in small snippets or little teeny pieces. So let's say you're examining, you're an ecologist and you want to examine the effects of global climate change. So now you might be looking at temperature profiles of the entire planet. That's fine um, and, and that's, that's great work and it's much needed, but it doesn't make, make you a biosphere ecologist. It makes you a climate ecologist. Um, and so we'll, we'll go through these and it's kind of important to know the distinctions mainly because no one knows the effects of every either abiotic component on the biotic component or the effects of everything on a given organism. It's not possible to know that. So when we look at ecology it's not a closed system. It's not like um, some of the other research that we do. So maybe you're, let's say you're researching a new medicine, a new drug, and the effects of that new drug on an individual. So you have one group that gets the new drug, another group that gets a placebo. Okay? And if the group is identical, so let's say we're using mice, white mice, okay? and you have 10 white mice, they're all clones, they're all identical to each other, okay? or closely identical to each other, in your experimental group and you have 10 in your control group, that's a controlled system. That's, that's as controlled as you can basically get it. As long as the temperature and the, the moisture, the um, amount of food and water and light conditions, everything is identical, then you can make inferences about whether or not that drug works. That's a controlled experiment. When ecologists do experiments, they try to control for as much as they can. But you have to realize, if you're examining wild populations, um, whether that be wild animals or wild plants or fungi or anything like that, there are a lot of conditions that you just can't account for. Right? And we'll look at these and, and we'll talk about things that might change the way an organism interacts within their, with their environment. Okay? So let's take redwood forest. For example, let's say you're a community ecologist for the redwood forest. Okay? So here's the dominant plant species, and that's often what the community is named after, um, whatever the dominant plant is in that community. And we know that the redwoods um, in Northern California, uh, you know, this is really the only place that you can find these types of trees. Okay? They're giant trees, um, at, at times well over 300 feet. Okay. and they have their own ecology. And so lots of biologists study the redwood community. And you might be a community ecologist that might be studying how the redwoods are affected or how they affect ferns or how they affect flowering plants or how they affect the insect communities like Tenobonidae, um, these darkling beetles. So what's going on? Or how does the beetle affect the fern or the flowering plant and then how does that affect the tree and so 
ecologists examine all the components and they examine well what would happen if we lost all these flowering plants? What happens if we lose all the darkling beetles? What happens if the ferns go away? What happens if the redwoods go away? Um, and so those kind of components are important for ecological perspectives on a given environment. Okay, so <clears throat> when we examine ecology, we normally examine a couple different pieces that are highly important. Okay? So the key elements to ecology of any given region really comes in these four things. Temperature, what's the temperature profile? And often this is determined like how many days are below zero, how many days above 90, okay? The water, so how much rainfall or snowfall does the region get in a given year? What's the sunlight situation? So is it always cloudy? Is it always sunny? Um, is there a lot of canopy cover like in the redwoods where you're going to have a lot of shade so plants can't grow underneath? And then what are the soil conditions? Those are the four main components to determining what is going to grow in a given region. Okay. Now when we start examining uh, animals, now we have to look at some other components to the, to the animal. So that, that, those components are really important for plants. Okay. And then there's a bunch of other components that come in when we start examining animals. Like, for example, this wolf in winter. Okay. We might be examining, well, what's the coat color like? Okay. Does their coat change with the change in environment? And this might link us back to genetics. We talked about epistasis and we talked about gene by environment interactions. We talked about some genes having the capability of turning off or turning on with different temperature profiles. So this organism might have a light coat in the winter and a dark coat in the summer okay, and when the snow melts. So there's other components that come into play with the organism itself. Okay? And that can also come into play with plants. I don't want to take anything away from plants, but from an animal perspective, it might be a lot more important than a plant perspective. Okay? Because there's also a major behavior component with animals also. So here you have a green iguana. Okay, the green color will match the plants in, in the region. Okay? And in some cases, some iguanas have the capability of changing color. So you have chromatophores, which will change color and allow them to match their background. But also there's a component of behavior. So the organism itself, you can see this organism seeking out shade. Okay? That behavioral thermal regulation is important for things that don't maintain a constant body temperature like wolves, for example, or mammals and birds, they're endothermic, so they maintain a constant body temperature. So it's no need for the individual typically to bask or, or seek cool regions, or the need is lessened than for organisms like lizards, which are ectotherms, and their body temperature mass or, or is determined by the environment which they're in. So for lizards and, and snakes and fish and other organisms that are um, ectotherms, they need to seek out or behaviorally change where they're at in an environment. So we need to keep those kind of ideas in play when we start examining an ecosystem. What happens if there is no vegetation for them to seek out shade? What happens to this organism? That's important. Those are important pieces for us to know. All right, so that brings me to population range. So again, a lot of ecologists are examining just populations of organisms. So they'll pick a certain species, and then they're examining a certain population of that species. Maybe it's one that occurs in a unique region, or maybe it's one um, that you know is a little bit different than others. Maybe it has a different range or something like that. Um, and they examine different components of that population. Like, where can you find that organism at a given time? Okay. So a population's range 
okay, is very important. But there are also other components to a population that we're interested in. Okay? So not just range, we're also interested how are they distributed on a given landscape. Are they clumped around a water source? Are they evenly spread across? Um, do you have little pockets of these organisms? Okay, that's distribution. What's their size? Is there lots of these organisms or very few? What's the density? Okay, so density might be even more important than size. You might have very few organisms uh, in a given region, but their density can still be high because they only occupy one small habitat. And there's, you know, quite a few of them okay, in that small habitat. Or you could have a huge population size, but they occupy a giant area, and the density of between those two might be the exact same. And then probably the most important component of a population is its growth. Are these populations increasing or are they decreasing? Okay. And that can tell you a lot about the use of resources in that given environment. So humans population has been increasing since about 1850. Okay. And you can see that 1850 the, the amount of people on the planet was 1 billion in 1850. So not even 200 years later, and we're almost at 8 billion. We've almost added 7 billion people in 200 years. By the time we get to 2050, we'll add 7 billion people to the planet. Okay. So what happens? That's population growth. Okay. What happens to the resources? What is that doing to other populations that might be in the same region of humans? Are we outcompeting other populations so their populations are actually declining? In many cases, that's, that's what we see. Okay. We'll come back and look at that. Okay. So there are some populations that are fairly easy to study, and um, in some cases it's really sad that that's the case because they have very small geographic ranges. So I talked about Devil's Hole Pupfish. It occurs right there. Okay, There's like... Hawaiian um, honey creepers and other Hawaiian birds that only occur on single islands in Hawaii. The Catalina Island mahogany tree, it only occurs on the Catalina Islands. Northern white rhinoceroses, you probably have heard of those. They make the news often because small populations are um, dying in rhinoceros, and there's a lot of poaching of them. Other things that only occur on single islands. Um, can be very important from that isolated perspective and what's going on with that population. Is that population in decline? Is it increasing? Um, is it possible that there's other habitats, other islands that that population could be migrated to or moved to? Um, yeah, so that's fairly important for examining single species. But the other piece is, except for those examples of organisms that are kind of landlocked, like a devil's hole pupfish, it occurs in a body of water that only occurs in one region. They're landlocked, so their population range is static. They're not moving. It's not possible for them to get up and walk across the landscape. But for most populations, their range is not static, and it changes throughout time. Now there are some cases that can dictate this change. It could be that the environment itself changes. So with global climate change, or with human introducing, introducing new species or clearing landscapes, deforestation, these kind of things, it opens up habitat for other species to migrate in or change their range. It might decrease the range of some things, so maybe let's say we have a forest and we clear cut half of it and we cut half of it off. So things like flying squirrels, which might need that forest knit habitat, their range is going to decrease. But for things that might need the open area, like mule deer or white-tailed deer, these kind of things that like that open area and need the grassland, their range might increase. Okay, and so you get this environmental change which can drive 
increase or drive population range shifts. Okay? And so <clears throat> we've examined this from like mountains and climate change in mountains, climate change on prairies, human disturbances in different regions, and there's a lot of examples of environmental changes that can affect uh, different populations of different organisms. The other thing that can occur is that a organism might just expand to a new range. And it, this could be a fluke. Um, for example, like Darwin's finches, when we talk about Darwin's finches, and the fact that the mainland finch somehow made it to the Galapagos Islands. Now we think that it was probably some tropical storm that kind of blew a few birds out there and maybe this happened multiple times. A few birds got blown out there and they could live there, got established, and then they could fly from island to island to island and they could establish new populations on the different islands, again creating what we call adaptive radiation or population explosions. This occurs with things that have the capability of moving, okay? maybe moving long distances. Okay? For example, cattle, cattle egret, which I'll talk about and show you a map soon, they've expanded because they have the capability of flying long distances. Okay? So here you can see due to climate change or due to a change in the environment, we've seen a change in what our mountain landscapes look like today compared to what they looked like when humans first made it to the landscape. Okay? So humans made it to North America, southwestern North America, probably 15,000 years ago or so. That's where most of the evidence suggests that's most of the human artifacts date to, carbon date to about 15,000 years ago. Well, what we see is different habitat during that period of time. Okay. There is a much larger alpine tundra than there is today. The spruce forests um, were much larger. And we start to see that over the last 15,000 years, some of this might be due to humans. Okay. Some of this might just be due to a cyclic change in the environment. But what we're seeing is the alpine tundra is shrinking. The spruce forests are shrinking. The Carnifer forests are shrinking, the woodland forests are shrinking, but the grassland and the desert habitats are increasing. And they're encroaching up the mountainside. So you got more grass, more desert scrub, that kind of stuff, moving further and further up the mountainside. In fact, in a lot of regions, there is no alpine tundra anymore, and the spruce forest goes all the way to the peak of the mountain. Okay? Well, this is problematic if you're a species that lives in the alpine tundra and there's no more then you don't live on that mountain any longer and you go extinct on that mountain. Okay. There's other natural expansions or I shouldn't say natural expansions but maybe not based on climate, maybe not based on changes within the climate but based maybe in some cases on uh, introductions by humans. So Humans introduced cattle early on okay, um, in the 1800s, but the expansiveness of the cattle industry from South America all the way into North America um, allowed for cattle egret, okay, which moved from Africa to um, tips of Brazil and, and to uh, the northern part of South America in 37. Okay. And then it didn't take them very long to make it into pretty much all the regions of the United States okay, and down even further into Argentina and things like that in South America. So um, they really expand fast. Now if there were not cows in the region or large ungulates for this bird to follow around, so what this bird does is as cows are, are walking through fields and things like that, this bird will follow the cows and it will pick off birds, and, or pick off insects, sorry. And that's, that's where they get the name cattle egret, um, is that they follow large ungulate herds. Now, if bison were still in this region, 
and the bison were moving and and herding and 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 uh, the cattle egrets could follow the bison, then the expansion probably would have happened anyways if the bird made it over here. Okay? So it's I'm not blaming cattle necessarily, but cattle allowed for this bird to expand because that's their lifestyle. That's their life history. They need to follow ungulates, big ungulates that move slowly and graze and kick up a lot of insects and produce a lot of insects for that matter. Um, and that's how the cattle egret kind of makes its living. So. All right, so with that, we're going to switch to start talking about the specifics on population. So we're going to talk more about population distribution, population growth. Um, we're going to talk about population density. So we're going to kind of dive in to some things like how is it calculated? How do you calculate population growth? Okay? And that will kind of give us a component on whether or not a population is increasing or decreasing. Okay? So next time.